Hello, and welcome to the lecture for chapter 18. Here we're going to discuss thermodynamics, which is kind of what we've been talking about the last three chapters, this being the fourth chapter on the discussion of temperature, heat, and thermodynamics. It's just that in this chapter we formally introduce the laws of thermodynamics and tie it in with conservation of energy. So let's get to it. Okay, so what are thermodynamics? We'll talk about absolute zero, which of course is the, the purpose of the Kelvin scale of temperature. Talk about the idea of internal energy, how that then allows us to define the first law of thermodynamics, since we already know about heat. Then what is an adiabatic process, which has to do with the concept called entropy. Then we'll get um, to a connection between the first law and meteorology. Finally move on to the second law of thermodynamics, which is the, the, la the last, there's just the first and the second. Then talk about disorder and how things that are ordered tend to become disordered and how that is in fact entropy. All right, so entropy you can see kind of is a topic that moves throughout the chapter. And this one is a little bit hard to pin down, but I think we'll get a good idea of what it is by the end. So the science of, the thermo of thermodynamics was developed in the early 19th century. Right? This is when it became a formal um, subcategory of physics. Atomic and molecular theory of matter was not understood. So early thermodynamics invoked macroscopic ideas of mechanical work, pressure, and temperature. And we still use these ideas today. Okay? Now, are there other approaches, more modern approaches to discussing how temperature works? Certainly. But the caveat is we can't actually calculate the kinetic energy and projectile motion of every individual particle when there are 10 to the 20 of them in a small sample. So we're kind of still stuck with thermodynamics. All right? Maybe we just need better computers. The, found, the foundation stones of thermodynamics are conservation of energy, right? and the fact that heat flows spontaneously from hot to cold, but not the other way. Okay, so this, so really it's reforming or reframing conservation of energy, that very important conservation law, and then talking about the fact that there's kind of a new law, which is that heat only flows in one direction. Right? That's maybe the thing that's truly unique and new about thermodynamics is that idea. Heat flows downhill, quote unquote, okay? All right, but you know, the conservation of energy really isn't new. It's just saying, oh, well, energy is conserved, and this, will, this is what it looks like when it's conserved for a system that involves heat. Okay, so absolute zero. As the temperature of a gas changes, the volume of the gas changes as well. At zero degrees, with pressure constant, volume changes by 1 273rd of the original volume. All right, so the remaining volume then would be 1 minus 273 over 273. So that means at absolute zero, gases take up no more space. Okay. Now, absolute zero does not apply to uh, electron motion. So electrons would still take up space. The atoms would still take up space. But based on this kind of, you know, like hypothetical idea, the, the, the distance between those molecules wouldn't take up space. And so the volume then is approximated as zero. But that is entirely hypothetical. It is a lower limit that doesn't exist as far as we know. All right. So molecules have lost all their available kinetic energy. But let me repeat, electrons have not. And there is actually something called the Fermi-Dirac distribution, which deals with the idea of electron, basically pressure, um, but we don't cover it in this class. Okay, but as far, as far as absolute zero goes, it is the lowest possible hypothetical temperature, at which point molecules take up no space. Okay, all right, hopefully that makes sense. Energy of the particle um, at the particle level within a substance um, has several forms, which taken together are called internal energy. Okay, so that's the internal energy of the substance. That could be, you know, vibrations and back and forth motion and so on. The internal energy of a substance is quite complicated, and the simplest form are the kinetic and potential energies of the molecules. Our study focuses on the internal energy per se, or not on the internal energy per se, but rather on the changes in internal energy. So we actually, we're never going to discuss, you know, even the, the basic methods of estimating internal energy, you know, on, for different types of molecules or anything like that. We just care about whether it's going up or going down. Okay. All right. So how does that tie in with energy conservation? Well, that's the first law of thermodynamics. Okay. And this is it. This is the statement. Okay. This is one of the things you have to know from this chapter. It states that the heat added to a system transforms to an equal amount of some other form of energy. So heat added equals increased internal energy plus work done by the system. Okay. So it would be Q for heat two because it's added to equals the change in internal energy, U for internal energy, and then plus the work done by the system. So then we can see if we were to solve for the change in internal energy, it would be heat added to minus work done by. 
And that makes sense because think about it as say like a, a hot gas. A hot gas is expanding, pushing on its surroundings that would be work by, like a piston or a balloon that's getting bigger because it's hot, okay, right? But then so, but then if it does a lot of work on its surroundings, then there's not any energy left for it to be hotter inside. So that's why Q2 minus work by would be delta U. And all I've done is just rearrange it. So it would look like this, delta U equals Q2 minus work by, okay? So in e, that both are just the same statements, just rearranged. And it just kind of depends what you're thinking about, all right? So the first law of thermodynamics is a restatement of the law of conservation of energy. So it is the same law, okay? So giving it a name as another law is a bit misleading, but, you know, it's specific to heat and, you know, it has some historical baggage. And it is just, it's simply based on the same premise that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Right? That absolutely applies here. Okay? So another implication is... The idea that instead of adding heat, if we do mechanical work on a system, we can expect an increase in internal energy. The temperature must rise. All right. So this is like the idea that you can like rub things together, that friction can warm things up. You know, of course, that's common sense, but that ties in directly with the, the premise of the first law of thermodynamics. There's also a cool apparatus, which is a common demo in a physics class when they're in person called the Joules apparatus. And the idea here is that the weights fall, they're falling over these fairly low mass, low friction pulleys, turning this central cylinder, which then spins turbines inside, the spinning of the water will warm up the water because the energy has to go somewhere. And as long as there's not too much being lost to friction, you can minimize these, then, that, then the water will appreciably warm up. Now water, of course, has a very high specific heat, so that the temperature increase is going to be small, but it will be definitely measurable, right? especially if these are large masses. Okay. So when work is done on a system, for example, compressing air in a tire pump, the temperature of the system must do what? All right, think about compressing air. It has to increase, okay? So the air temperature would absolutely go up, okay? We don't really care about that when, we, when we're trying to compress, you know, have like a pressurized tire. We don't care that it's slightly warmer, but it will be, all right? Because the energy has to go somewhere, all right? Of course, then, of course, as we know, heat's going to flow. It's going to reach equilibrium with the outside due to um, conduction to the rubber in the case of a, a, a tire. But you know, it's still there, it's still gonna warm up, okay? Because energy is conserved. Now, as far as energy conservation, let's talk about something called an adiabatic process, okay? So I bring this up because this, is, this would be in a more formal math-based physics class. We would talk about this process and the other types of common thermodynamic processes in the context of using the first law of thermodynamics. Since it's our framework, it's conservation of energy, and allows us to highlight what remains constant and what changes. Now. The other types of processes are basically holding things at constant vol volume, holding them at constant pressure, or holding them at constant temperature. But adiabatic is kind of the strange one out because it has to do with entropy, which we're just starting to define. So let's get to it. So compressing or expanding a gas while no heat enters or leaves the system is called an adiabatic process. So that would mean that means that your Q2 is zero, which then tells you that zero is your change in internal energy plus the work done on the system. So that means that the work done by or on the system is exactly equal to the change in internal energy, all right? And specifically, the work done by the system would be equal to the negative of the change in internal energy. Likewise, the work done on the system would be equal to the positive of the change in potential energy, all right? Well, internal energy. And as far as why that works, anytime I change the subscript from by to on, it picks up a negative because it's just the opposite direction. All right. And that's why these two statements that I've circled are equivalent to each other. All right. And this is the one we often kind of are going to think about in terms of adiabatic processes, because we think about doing a bunch of work on a system really quickly and then having the, the internal energy change. Although the flip side is we could have internal energy change rapidly and then have a bunch of, um, you know, have it decrease and then have that, that, that substance do work on the outside world. That'd be the case of an explosion or the combustion cycle in a combustion engine. All right, but let's get to it. All right, so adi adiabatic conditions are achieved by thermal, thermal insulation because that would, that would cause this to check out, that Q2 equals zero, because it, it prevents any flow from heat with the outside world. Now, is there such thing as perfect insulation? No, so that means that you have to do it rapidly because that's the only way you can have anything even approaching a, a good estimate of an adiabatic process. Okay, because truly you can never have perfect insulation. So there's always going to be some heat flowing. So the only way to even have something that's an approximation of adiabatic, because it, in reality it doesn't quite exist, but we can get darn close, is to have good insulation and then have the process happen quickly. 
because inevitably, if it happens slowly, then equilibrium is going to be reached. We know it has to be reached eventually, okay? But if we do it fast enough, we can get an adiabatic process, okay? So here it is, heat added to the system is zero. That was just my Q2 equals zero, Q for heat. So increase and decrease in internal energy equals the work done on by the system, okay? And the sub, the, um, this dash here would match up. So increase on, decrease by, okay? The example, when we compress air using a bicycle pump, all right, when we do work on the system, we heat up the air up um, inside, increases its internal energy, all right? So it's not, there's not much because it's happening rapidly. And as long as the pump is fully expanded, then it's on, then, you know, that's, that's going to be the work that's being done, okay? Um, or it's, see, the work being done on the system is the pumping the gas in, and that's going to cause an increase in internal energy, okay? Blow air on your hand first with your mouth wide open, then with puckered lips, okay? Go ahead and do it. In which case is the air coming out of your mouth cooler? All right. Well, I'm sure you noticed. All right. When your lips are puckered. Okay. So why is that? Well, when you pucker your lips, the air expands as it comes out. That's essentially an adiabatic process. All right. And that means that it's going to cool off. So rapid expansion of air um, in, surrounded by other air is actually a good estimate of, adi of the adiabatic process. You might be like, well, it's not well insulated. Well, it actually kind of is because air is an insulator. So pockets of air, at least for an instant, are insulated relative to the surrounding air. And so if this mechanism works for kind of natural cooling in houses and obviously for blowing out of puckered lips versus a wide open mouth. Okay? All right. Okay? So how does meteorology tie in with the first law, this idea of conservation of energy? This is kind of neat because this is a practical application of conservation of energy via the first law of thermodynamics. So thermodynamics is useful to meteorologists when analyzing the weather. The first law of thermodynamics is expressed as air temperature rises as heat is added or pressure is increased, okay? So heat may be added from solar radiation, radiation back from the earth, like, you know, a really hot desert that's reflecting a lot of um, light, or maybe one that's just heated up and then it's radiating infrared light, thus heat. Moisture condensation, right? Because that's gonna cause um, a, the air to hold more heat and contact with the ground, all right? So in the, in the adiabatic form, when no heat is added, because remember again, that's, what, that's all adiabatic means, the first law, th first law of thermodynamics is, becomes quite simple because it tells us that the air temperature rises or falls as pressure increases or decreases. So it's as simple as that. It's a direct relationship between pressure and temperature. And that's great for meteorologists because that's a great starting point of a simplified system that then they can have some expectations and then add layers of complexity from there. So the adiabatic process in the atmosphere occur in large parts of the air called parcels. It's kind of like that packet of air I was mentioning regarding uh, blowing blowing air out of your mouth, but in this case they're much larger, but they still have that idea that they're, they're fairly well insulated as long as they don't give them enough time to interact with the surrounding, you know, the surrounding atmosphere, okay? So parcels are large enough that the outside air doesn't appreciably mix with the air inside them. They behave, behave as, if they, as if they're enclosed giant tissue-like garment bags. It's a funny way to think about it. So as the parcels of air rise, they experience lower pressure, and so they expand. Why do they experience lower pressure? Well, we've talked about this. Atmospheric pressure is a function of depth, okay? I'll refer back to our chapter on fluids. The expanding air cools down 10 degrees for every one kilometer, okay? So this is a general rule. Is it perfect? No, but it's a good general rule. Air continues to rise and expand as long as it has a higher temperature than its surroundings. When it gets cooler than the surroundings, then it begins to sink, right? So here we just see the cooling, right, going from 15, 15 um, degrees Celsius air um, all the way up to negative 15 degrees Celsius air at a altitude of four kilometers above the surface, all right? So high, it's going to just continue to cool and expand, all right? It's an adiabatic process. As the parcels of air drop, they experience higher pressure and heat up, all right? So this is a type of wind called a Chinook wind that descends from the Rockies into the Great Plains and it warms up in the process, all right? So it's a warming wind coming off of those mountains. So the air continues to uh, rise and expand as long as it has a higher temperature in the surroundings. When it gets cooler than the surroundings, it sinks. So sometimes, right, these, these are restatements. So sometimes cooler air occurs at an altitude lower than warmer air. This is called temperature inversion, right? Maybe you've heard of this, all right? During a temperature inversion, if rising warm air it, um, is denser than the upper layers of the warm air, it will no longer rise. It, get tr it gets trapped, right? So we can see smoke from a campfire sometimes may not rise and it just spreads out. Right? Maybe you've seen this phenomenon with smoke, right? And then smog in valleys like the Los Angeles Valley is trapped by the hot air from, that is descending off of the mountains, okay? 
So, you know, obviously it requires some sort of, um, you know, landscape, some sort of mountains or something to have this hot air that's coming down to create this temperature inversion, but it prevents, it prevents any further rising because it can't, it can't, it can't rise and cool if it's, if there's not cooler air to rise into. And so then that's, this is going to then have that smog trapped in LA. Okay. All right. So if a parcel of dry air initially at 10 degrees Celsius at ground level expands adiabatically, Okay, no heat flow with the surroundings, or very little. While flowing upward alongside a mountain, a vertical distance of five kilometers, what will its temperature be? Right, so this is simply using that rule of the, the temperature drop per kilometer. Well, right, it, it drops at 10 degrees Celsius every one kilometer. And so we just simply do our math here, and we find the, the, the change would be 40, or um, 20, excuse me. And so then the um, final temperature is gonna be negative 10 degrees. Okay, all right. So heat itself, okay, we're on to the second law. Heat itself, that's gonna be the focus of the second law. No energy conservation, but understanding some fundamentals. It never spontaneously flows from a cold object to a hot object. We actually stated this in the previous chapter when we were talking about temperature. And we just kind of said, oh, hey, this is a rule, we'll take it as that. This is the formal law, okay? Now, the second law of thermodynamics kind of has the, um, the unlucky role of being a hard law to pin down because there's no one equation to represent it. Then we, can, we can get into some equations, that become, but then we have to really have a formal definition of entropy and it involves calculus. So usually it's written as sentences and there's a lot of different ways of writing it kind of depending on what your focus is. Um, but don't let that confuse you because I mean, that's all the better, right? Less math. And what it's saying is that it's just that there's just these, these key ways of conceptualizing the second law of thermodynamics. And one totally valid way is this. Heat never spontaneously flows from cold to hot, okay? It only flows spontaneously from hot to cold, okay? And we got some examples. In the summer, heat flows from the hot air inside um, the house into the cooler interior. In the winter, the heat flows from the warm, the warm inside to the cold exterior, all right? So, um, so, so I may have said that backwards. In the summer, it flows from the hot outside to the cool interior because it flows from hot to cold from, in that case, outside, inside, and in the winter, it flows from inside to outside because it's, again, flowing from hot to cold. Heat can flow from cold to hot only when work is done on the system or by adding energy from another source. So you can pump, right? You can absolutely pump heat, okay? But that does apply outside work that is not spontaneous. See the key, the key word there? All right, so heat pumps, air conditioners, definitely um, require outside energy and they can force heat to flow the opposite direction. A heat engine is a nice way of thinking about the second law. Okay, so this is a conceptual device of thinking about the second law. And it has some, some actual applications of true engines, but we're not trying to say that, you know, we're talking about any specific real life engine. All right, so it's a device that converts internal energy into mechanical work. The basic idea behind a heat, engines, heat engine is that mechanical work can be obtained only when heat flows from a high temperature to a low temperature. Okay, so if in every heat engine, only some of the heat can be transform, transformed into work. So every heat engine involves having the natural process of heat flowing from hot to cold, from high to low, because that doesn't happen naturally, and then co-oping some of that, that, that heat flow, saying, okay, well, there's gonna be this natural, say, boiling process, there's gonna be this natural, you know, kind of like hot air rising, and I'm just gonna steal some of that energy. You're never gonna steal some of it because that process is gonna happen spontaneously and naturally, so there's always gonna be some condensation, there's always gonna be some natural cooling, but you can, say, put a turbine in the direction of hot air rising, and that turbine's gonna spin, and you're gonna steal some of that energy. And that's what a heat engine is, but it can never be perfect because you can never steal some of that energy because that process is still going to happen. You're just re-diverting some of it, okay? So here is a some schematic that every physics textbook has some version of which shows you the principles of a heat engine, all right? So it always has a reservoir of hot, um, hot temperature, so a high temperature reservoir. That's this one right here, okay? This could be, I, um, in terms of a steam engine, this could just be your boiling water. Right, think like an old-fashioned steam train with a steam engine, okay? They got a big, big like, um, you know, um, cauldron. It's not a cauldron, but like a big chamber of boiling water, right, heated by coal, right? But you have that big chamber of boiling water. That would be your high-temperature reservoir, okay? Reservoir just because it's, you know, it's a source of high temperature. And then we have a sink at lower temperature. This is not literally like a kitchen sink or a bathroom sink. This is just a sink in the term of, like, it's a place for things to go to, okay? That, that's, a, you know, like things sink into it. So sinks and sources are common terms that, that physicists and engineers throw around. And so this is a sink of low temperature, okay? It's also a low temperature reservoir, but it's, a, it's an outlet of low temperature, okay? So what happens in the heat engine? Well, you gather heat from the hot reservoir at the high temperature. 
you convert some of this heat into mechanical work, okay? So this would be like the turbine on the steam engine, right? This is the steam rising. As it rises, it can spin something, it can turn something, it can then power a steam, a steam train, right? Because it turns that into mechanical work. But some of, that, some of that hot rising steam, like I said before, as an example, is gonna condense, right? It's gonna, it's gonna liquefy, it's gonna drop out of the air, and you can't capture all of it. So inevitably, some of that, that cool water is gonna drip off of the spinning turbines, and then it's gonna fall down into your low reservoir. And so there's always gonna be some exhaust, okay? So there's gonna be heat input into the engine itself, okay? This, this blue thing is the engine, this turquoise bluish, the bluish thing is the heat engine. That heat engine does some work, right? And it can do a fair amount of work, but it will always have exhaust, okay? So it always is gonna expel the rest of the heat into the low temperature um, sink. Now, what can happen is that low temperature reservoir then through an input of energy like the, the burning of coal can then get returned to the high temperature and you can repeat the process, okay? So, apply to heat engines, the second law of thermodynamics is stated as such. When work is done by a heat engine operating between two temperatures, T hot and T cold, only some of the input heat at T hot can be converted to the work to work, right, W, and the rest is expelled as T cold. Okay, so every heat engine expels some heat. Okay, the hood of the car becomes hot, hot air is expelled from a laundry or baking oven. Okay, even nuclear power plants have those big cooling towers. Okay, every single heat engine expels heat. Okay, so the case that we're gonna care about, the simple, simple case, which is the, the best, best case scenario, is called the Carnot um, engine because it's named after the person who determined that this is the absolute, absolute maximum possible efficiency, maximum possible. All right, and in that case, for this perfect ideal engine that doesn't exist as far as we know, we then would say that the best case efficiency would be dictated by the temperature alone. So whatever is the temperature of your hot reservoir minus the temperature of your cold reservoir divided by the temperature of the hot reservoir would be your absolute upper case for efficiency, okay? Now, real engines actually aren't proportional to the temperatures. They're actually proportional to the heat flow itself because inevitably they have some friction. They have some loss of energy within the system. Um, so this, this is a case assuming perfect friction, no, no turbulence, nothing like that, okay? All right, okay? So, yep, due to friction, right? It's not, it's not this high, but this is a good, this is a good point because this, in, even in this non-existent ideal case, it's never 100%. Okay, so that's the interesting thing. It's like, even in the ideal case, you can't have 100% efficiency. And in real life, you can't even have come close to the efficiencies that you would get from the ideal efficiency. Okay, so it's kind of interesting. Because we don't have a lot of laws in physics that say, oh, you just can't do something, right? But that actually is what the second law of thermodynamics is saying, is that there's no such thing as a 100% efficiency engine. Okay? All right. So what is the ideal efficiency of a heat engine that is operated between a hot reservoir of 400 Kelvin and a cold sink of 300 Kelvin? Well, you'd simply use that formula you would take 400 minus 300 over 400, okay? And the Ks just cancel out, right? That's gonna be your ideal efficiency, okay? It's not gonna be a percent, it's gonna be in a fraction, okay? So when we do that, all right, what do we get? Well, right, in this case, they factored out the 400 and we just have one minus um, three-fourths, which is one-fourth efficiency, okay? That's not even very high, and that's an ideal case. But of course, the temperature difference wasn't that great. A difference between 400 and Kelvin isn't, you know, really kind of a best case scenario. You can definitely get things hotter than 400. You can have an engine that's operating at say 1100 Kelvin and a reservoir that's much colder than that, okay? So here's another way to think about thermodynamics. So, so far we just have the, the basic, basic way that says that heat only spontaneously flows from hot to cold. Then we have the way that's specific to this, this kind of mental construct called the heat engine, which I think is nice because it's kind of concrete. You can kind of go back to it. It's got a good visualization to it, okay? But now we have a third way of thinking about thermodynamics, and that's about thinking about it in terms of something called disorder, okay? So a restatement. In natural processes, high quality energy tends to transform into low quality energy. What the heck does that mean? Well, high quality energy is ordered. Low quality energy is disordered. Think about biology. Okay, biology has lots of ordered energy. You know, all the processes that are going on inside of cells, you know, based, up, based on organelles, right, and then involve, or, you know, ordering and organizing DNA and RNA, right, that would be high quality ordered energy, okay? But then when something dies and those cells, so, those cells stop operating, then that process starts to, you know, just break down into simple molecules, okay? There's, you know, there's, there's gonna be, you know, parts of the, the, the food chain that are gonna come in and kind of help with that breakdown, but the inevitable process is gonna be breaking down all those complicated 
organelles, you know, complex systems of biological mar- um, molecules that you know that could do things like like you know create patterns into just a bunch of disordered bi- molecules. Okay, so from life to death would be from order to disorder, and that's a natural process that that occurs with everything. Everything is going to die, and then, so you see in biology that that the second law of thermodynamics is completely backed up by this idea of order going to disorder. Okay, so that's the idea. Nature does follows that process. And entropy is the measure of disorder. It's the actual quantified way of saying how disordered or ordered something is. So the measure of the amount of disorder is called entropy. So high entropy is highly disordered. Okay? So it's not, the, it's not a measure of order. It's a measure of disorder. Okay? So if the disorder increases, the entropy decreases. Yeah, increases. Okay, so disorder increases, entropy increases. Entropy can decrease. It absolutely does if work is put in from the outside world. That's how you have life in the first place. You have energy coming in. Every organism requires an input of energy, whether it's you know through metabolic energy of eating things, whether it's through photosynthesis. But all living things take in energy, and then they can create order. Okay, so living organisms. All right, so. Your locker gets messier each week. In this case, the entropy of your locker is, it's for high school students, but it's what? It's increasing. Absolutely, right? And that happens in your home, right? I live in a home with two small children. I, I see that increase in entropy. It takes a significant amount of work to not have it increase, like quite a bit, okay? And it's just a natural thing. It's not just like, oh, things just get messy. No, that's actually a real thing. That's, it is inevitable. Every little thing involves just creating disorder, Okay, so the net entropy of the universe is continually increasing because the, the universe as a whole is a closed system, right? From the Big Bang on, there has been no, there's, there, as far as we know, there's no like other universe that's inputting energy. Okay, this is it. Okay, it's, so that's, in that case, it just has to be getting more and more disordered. We can have pockets of things getting more ordered, like the Earth, for example, but that's coming at the cost of the overall universe becoming more disordered. Okay, so the idea then is that the energy must um, eventually get to a point where we're going to have, you know, this this final state of disorder. So the second law of thermodynamics is a probabilistic statement. All right. Given enough time, even the most improbable states occur. Okay, so entropy may sometimes decrease. Okay, so you can you can have certain cases It's like, you know, you flip a coin 10,000 times, you can have 500 heads in a row. Okay, so there absolutely can be random chances of entropy not increasing. And this might be how life is formed in the first place, just random chance of order. And then once you have life, then that then life, you know, will continue to propagate itself. Okay. All right. So that's it for our review of the first and second laws of thermodynamics and how they tie in with ideas like energy and temperature. All right. Well, I hope it's been interesting. And also do know this is our final of four chapters on heat, temperature, and thermodynamics. So we're going to be moving on to a brand new subject after this. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it was interesting.